This interview with Bill Broyles was conducted by Helen Ingram in 2010. It is to start it off with a strong conservation direction, and then it kind of drifted off into we're going to do an arts center, mm -hmm. uh, we're going to rehab historic buildings yep. in Ajo, yep. like the right. Curly School. Right. I understand they've just bought the plaza within uh, recent months, mm -hmm. and um, which gives it a much more localized Ajo thing, because there's, there's a lot of people don't care much about Ajo one way or the other. Right. And so when you do that, you, you, you can find the people who are interested. To the Ajo. To Ajo. And, but there's a reason for that, because with, without a strong local base, mm -hmm. it's hard to sustain something. Mm -hmm. you, you, the early ISDA meetings had people from Phoenix, San Felipe, mm -hmm. uh, Tijuana, Hermosillo, Tucson, Ajo, um, and, and points in between, and occasionally somebody out of Washington, D.C., or somebody out of uh, Mexico City. But um, it, when you have kind of a far-flung group like that, it's hard to get any work done. Okay. And so that's, that's why so many of the, uh, probably the second generation board members on ISDA, mm -hmm. and, and ISDA I think is a typical organization probably, Mm -hmm. So many of the second generation people were locals because somebody, you know, like in my case, I didn't think it was, somebody asked me to run for that board and I thought, man, that'd be great if we could get some things done. But I was working and you can't just take off on a Tuesday. Oh, it's a long way from here. It's a long way. And, and the other thing is that, especially when you want to have committee meetings and things, right. You got to get people together. It's, yeah. it's it, you can't do a lot of stuff. Or I should say, there's a lot of stuff you can't do by telephone. Yeah. And especially those relationships of that, that make people bond. That 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 kind of drive them to put in that extra two or three hours late at night to get something finished for tomorrow. So you think a lot of these organizations are built not around so much subject matter as localities? I'm just wondering because I'm I'm thinking that the Sea of Cortez is clearly both a locality and a subject matter. Well, I, th I think that someplace like Ajo, of course, it, it, right. it sits, you, you've probably seen Wendy's famous map that Bo McClure, I think, drew for her. She, she threw out this question, this, this sphere of influence, because we were trying to, to solve some particular problems right. in, in a certain area. And so that was the, the axle, was the Ajo area. Mm -hmm. But part of the problem with these groups is trying to figure out a mission statement of what, what they're trying to do or what their real area is. Mm -hmm. Because you come down, it, it seems to me from what I've seen, that you want to protect the desert. Mm -hmm. You want to protect the lifestyle and, and life ways of people that live in the desert. Yes, right. You know, you don't want them overrun by uh, uh, some big new housing development or community. or. Uh, well, it's sure happening in Puerto Vinasco. It has, and it, it's you know, it's, it's dreadfully affected the local people. Yeah, just dreadfully. And, and part of what happens is what what local people I think are, are coming to realize is that you can, you can have this big new business move in with the promise of jobs, but those jobs won't be yours. That's right. Because other people with more skills, more education, whatever, will come in and take those jobs, and you're still without a job. Right. Right. And you have even less vote, even less say, and higher taxes and whatever else than you had before. And so less water. Less no, water. Ocean. Less water. Um, you know, I, a microcosm of this in my mind is Karchner Cavern and, and the Benson experience. Yeah. Because <clears throat> they didn't rezone the land around Benson to fit what they expected to happen. They expected those mainstream stores. And mm -hmm. businesses and the and the existing hotels and beds and breakfasts and stuff to to prosper with it with that. But what happened, of course, is <clears throat> they put that 
uh, expand the intersection out there. Yeah. And new restaurants come in, fast food places, and a new hotel and right. stuff. And that that just just sorts up every bit of business that would have gone to right. the town. Right. And, uh, and then what happens? You know, you go back to the is the problem of how do you get local people to support something? Right. And so much of even today, Helen, I think that a lot of and Tracy Taft it is that mm-hmm. could tell you more about right. this, but. It seems to me a lot of the support for even ISDA in Ajo is not from people that have lived there more than 10 years. It's from either newcomers, retirees who have moved in, or people who are still um, snowbirds, either from the northwest or back east or wherever they happen to come from. Do you think that that serves then a socializing function to introduce these people into desert culture and uh, sort of the environment? around? Is it a really useful uh, agent in that way? You know, with with people moving in and out of this area so much, um, the difficulty is nobody knows anything about it. It continually gets rediscovered. Well, I think a lot of them know know what's there because and that's why they come. Right, okay. They, they, have, they have visited, for example, Oregon Pipe either right. in, in previous days or on the way to the Gulf, and, and, and they, they come preloaded, predisposed mm-hmm. to enjoy the desert. You know, okay. we're going to move to the desert. And and many of them, for example, in Ajo would, would love to stay in the desert because, you know, the climate's uh, salubrious and and uh, you got a lot of open space and the seasons and all that stuff. But what they find is the reality of living in a small town where you don't have access to good medical help. Right. You know, if you have a serious medical problem in Ajo, you go to Phoenix or you go to Tucson. Sometimes in an ambulance and sometimes in a helicopter, but you got to go, right. and uh, it, it's tough on people. And even even other services, you know, everything from uh, that that older people need, from um, estate planners to uh, stock market, although that's you know more on internet and stuff. Um, so it's it, it's it's a bit difficult to live in a place like Ajo in some respects. Right. And what, what's been what's been very nice to see is that some people, I can't remember the, uh, Mr. Olson's first name, but a guy named Olson has Olson's Markets, mm-hmm. and they have a new Olson's Market and a new Chevron station and, <clears throat> and some other little businesses that have been moving in, which which has really upgraded the quality because, in, in especially you know, Ajo is a, a very strange town, Helen, because it was a Phelps Dodge town. Yeah. It was a mining town, and that's why Ajo to this day doesn't have any self-government. Yeah. Because they always had PD to, right. to take care of things. Right. And uh, you know, there's people that still live in that town who will brag about when they were working at the mine, they'd work 28 straight days and get two days off, and work 28 straight days. Copper collar. Exactly. You know, Burkett was right. Yeah, he really was. And uh, that copper collar still is around the neck of many of the retirees that live there. Yeah. And that's that's all they can think about. And then, of course, you have these these other resentments, either imagined or real, right. against the federal government right. um, for taking the Barry Goldwater land away, for creating organ pipe, for creating... Uh, Cabeza Prieta uh, for uh, establishing wilderness in Cabeza Prieta in, in Oregon Pipe. And, uh, you know, they, they say, well, we can't go the places we used to go. And, you know, you're stifling small business and, <clears throat> and um, things like, um, you know, Oregon Pipe and the Cabeza were opposed by the Small Miners Association. Mm-hmm. Of course, there's never been anything out there except the, the Ajo Copper Pit, which is not inside of Oregon Pipe or the Cabeza. Uh, there was some little, the guy named Bert Long fought the feds for years about <coughs> about his mining claims and stuff, but they never amounted to piddly. Yeah. You know, he put more money into them than he ever got out sure. of the ground. Yeah. And well, he had to have somebody to blame for the lack of... He had to have somebody to blame. and, and uh, it, it gets to be kind of a, you try to think of why people moved to Ajo in the first place. Right. And it was kind of a backwater place. Right. 
Uh, it was like the Gray family, you know, amazing ranchers, they're tough, durable, independent people. But the reason they ended up there is because they got kicked out of Texas and they got run out of Benson, and they just kept heading west with their cattle. Yeah. And suddenly they're on the edge, they can't go any farther west because there's no, no, no feed for their livestock. Yeah. And they find this little niche to live in. Well, you know, it's not necessarily a bad thing, but, but those are the, the kinds of people and mentality that you deal with in a small town. And to try to update that with some kind of modern, you know, 21st century appreciation of ecology, uh, human rights, uh, civil rights, uh, economy, internet-based economy, these kinds of things. It's, it's a tough, tough go over there. Do you think part of it is getting people to talk to one another when they don't really sort of have empathy or understand one another? Is that part of it? Certainly it seemed to be part of Wendy's agenda. Communication has gone a long way. What else? And uh, well, partly just trying to find out who the people are that live there and, 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 and the histories. And that's, that's part of what I'm still working mm -hmm. on is mm -hmm. interviewing people to try to find out what was it like. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, you know, for example, there's, there's a, a famous uh, social club in town called the Choo Choo Club. And as near as I can gather, it's kind of war veterans, Mexican-Americans, and they kind of get together. It's kind of like this big family, but, but it's kind of a closed society. Mm -hmm. But in my interviews, when, I, when I've gone out and, and talked to old-timers, every one of them has been just as pleasant as can be and answered all my stupid questions and, and, and gave really revealing things about their lives and their families and mm -hmm. what they were doing there, and, and most of them are pretty candid about that. Right. And, and um, you know, dialogue has to be two people or more people. Right. It, it, well, it, and dialogue doesn't have to always be face-to-face. -face. In some cases, it's through work like yours, either by introducing people to other people mm -hmm. or to people to places they might not right. all, or, right. you know, because they might not have uh, the adventuresome spirit, or be the willing to face the heat, or unknown territory, that kind of empathy mm -hmm. uh, for the other, um, which is clearly, there's a bunch of sort of Southern Arizona writers <laughs> who've long kind of had that goal, I think. I don't mm -hmm. know whether it's, uh, I don't know about writers, I'm not one, I'm only an academic, but whether or not that's uh, a conscious thought? Is that something you think about as what you're doing? You say, I, I don't know. I, I spent a little time on the web and there's some interview with you someplace that said I never intended to be a writer. That, <laughs> <laughs> I think most writers would say that. You know, yeah. just, this is kind of where I am today and who knows what tomorrow will bring. Right, but, right. But I think it's part of, of continuing the dialogue on okay, paper if okay. it can't be face to face. Okay, okay. And, um, yeah, you know, I've really enjoyed talking to people in awe, and, and but it goes back to some pretty basic things that you have to try to not only understand their position but respect their position right, because right. You know, they they believe certain things not because they're stupid but because it, this is what's worked for them in the past or it's what yes. they see from their perspective. I, I'll give you an example. Um, a uh, special ed teacher named Kate Garmice mm -hmm. moved to Aho. 15 years ago, maybe, and she's kind of a hermit, and she's a close friend of mine. But along the way, she started working for the Copper News newspaper and developed a little, because she lives in the desert and lives in a, in a house that's off the grid and you know, uses a, a, a cell phone and, and uh, doesn't have electricity except off solar panels and hauls her own water and stuff. Um, built the cutest little house, she, she started writing partly for her own enjoyment and, and, and certainly for readers and to make a little money. She tried to fill this niche and she wrote a book called, Cact I mean not a book, but a column called Cactus Kate, K-A-C-T-U-S, Kate, and every week she'd have, I don't know, six, eight, ten, twelve inches of things on a 
tarantula or a saguaro flower or uh, something she saw in her yard, a rattlesnake or, um, you know, what flowers are blooming. In the ajo paper? In the ajo paper. And I think it went on for, I'm guessing, eight or ten years. I could, you know, I can call her up and ask her if you really want to know. But, but what it did is that very softly, very gently introduces okay. this, this ecological message mm-hmm. that, that many people already feel. I mean, that people in Ajo, they don't like the feds, partly because they want to go out in the desert and camp because they love the desert. Okay. You know, it's not like they're against desert. They just don't want somebody telling them what they can do when they get out there. Right. And, and yet, when you sit down and talk to them, <coughs> many of them are furious. I'm talking about at least a certain group of old-timers that I, I keep in contact with. Many of them are furious because BLM lets snowbirds come out there yeah. in their big RVs and just yeah. camp anywhere. Yeah. And they will complain, you know, I, I can't go plinking with my 22 because yeah. there's Winnebago's there. Or uh, there's... there's uh, you know, a big family that has 14 trucks out there for a week, and you know that's my favorite uh, place to go walking or something. So, right. so they they begin to see the problem of what happens when you have too many people, and and have that kind of um, effect on on ground, okay. either, either either on space or on the ground itself. And uh, I remember talking to one guy who was furious because he found out that one of the Winnebago guys. He, he, he followed the concrete truck out of town. He couldn't figure out what somebody was doing with a concrete truck and out of town. But the, this Winnebago out there on BLM land, public land, had poured a slab for a porch and had also installed a septic tank. And, you know, for somebody in all, they thought, this is pretty outrageous. It is pretty outrageous. And, and uh, there, there's uh, several motorhome parks that have actually in the last 10 years, upgraded um, the Kleinfelters and then also um, uh, Steve Holt, I'm sorry, Mike Holt, um, have have these big RV parks. But at one time, they were pretty upset with with BLM because they'd let these campers camp out there, not paying a fee, they could stay two weeks, they could do anything they want to. And they weren't supporting the local economy. You know, we've got this place in town, why don't you camp in town? Yeah. And, um, you know, even, even in a place like Oregon Pipe, there's an undercurrent, Helen, of, of these people aren't staying in the Oregon Pipe campground right. because they like the desert. They just want a free and place, place to, to or a cheap stay. place to exactly. stay. Exactly, exactly. Do you think that this is something which is changing, you know, from, uh, that from for a long time now? These federal agencies talk a lot about collaboration with local people, you know, um, more public involvement in sort of local decision making and certainly that's part of the ISDA effort it's part of all of these efforts is to sort of engage people and in talking to Gary he seems to think that um, things are more collaborative but it doesn't sound to me like the people you're interviewing are any or happier with the feds than they've been from the time I was a little girl growing up in the western slope of Colorado they were mad at the feds then for uh, public lands and their lack of local control over it, and it doesn't sound as if that's much changed. Well, I, the antagonism against the feds actually goes two ways now, because they, they have this idea, some of them have the idea that, you know, we should go back to the old days. You even see this in the, there's a letter in the paper today about, you know, what are they saying when we should go back to the old days, you know, slavery and all that other kind of stuff, kill the Indians, and we can't do that. Um, and, and yet there's some of the newer people coming to Ajo, and once again I'm being general, right. um, are mad at the feds because they don't enforce the wilderness rules, they don't enforce the border, uh, wilderness is being trashed in Cabezo, Credit and Oregon Pipe, um, yeah, there's a real impact on, on the land out there, and uh, the feds should be doing more to prevent that. Right. And, um, so you know, the, 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 the feds are kind of do, damned if they do and damned if they don't. Right, so there isn't anything, any any tools or any processes that they could gauge in that probably would uh, make any difference here because they have limited resources and uh, after all it was the sort of closing down of the California sector that moved people out here to begin with. Uh, well, I think, I think there is process that can be done. Okay. Um, and, and, and part of it's, it's, in a, it's a very... 
It's a very open meeting, but few people attend, and it's the Barium Goldwater Range Partners okay. meeting. Okay. And um, literally, Helen, sometimes I'm the only public person there. But this is a meeting mandated by um, the Goldwater Range Renewal Act of Congress. Mm -hmm. And so, as as um, one of the people who's central to the whole thing, Jim Buchan says, we're going to have this meeting if we have to, you know, hold it in our own office and nobody comes because they're mandated three times a year to have this meeting. And it's, right. a, it's a place that you can come ask the agency's questions, that you can make suggestions, you can make complaints. But more than that, it's a place you can come and listen to what they're seeing and what they're trying to do. And they have made enormous strides, Helen, from, say, ten years ago when some of the agencies never even talked to each other. Okay. They didn't have a clue who to call. And ten years ago, or well, perhaps even five or six years ago, the the military was the the thousand pound gorilla, uh -huh. and nowadays it's the border patrol. Okay. Because border patrol, through some decisions that that yeah. I would disagree with, they don't have to uh, comply with NEPA. No, I know. They just do what they want to do. Yeah. Fortunately. Uh, there are some people in Border Patrol who are enlightened and they understand that they need to work with these other agencies and that these other agencies have missions just like Border Patrol has a mission. So how do we, how do we co either combine our missions mm -hmm. or how do we mesh our missions so that we can both accomplish what we're trying to do? And there's been a lot of dialogue. And unfortunately, when the politicians get involved, it all, you know, it all turns to crap. Yeah. Um, like this guy from, where is it, Bennett from Utah or someplace that that wants the Border Patrol to be able to do anything and everything. And uh, other people, even John McCain, in, in threatening moments, has said, well, we'll just do away with wilderness and the cabeza and an organ pipe, and then Border Patrol can go wherever they want to. Right, right. Um, but he, I don't think even Border Patrol wants that, at least the people I mm -hmm. talked to. Um, one thing that Border Patrol did that's very proactive mm -hmm. is that they began a program called Public Lands Liaison, where they actually have uh, fairly senior agents, knowledgeable people, who attend the public lands meetings. Mm -hmm. They coordinate with the public lands managers, the BLM, the Park Service, the Fish and Wildlife Service, and uh, these guys are really sharp and plus they love the ground. Right. You know, they're, they're outdoors people. All right, and well, so far we've been talking about these public agency people and collaborating with one another, mm -hmm. but, and they're providing um, sort of platforms or arenas for public participation or just people coming in and listening if they want to. Mm -hmm. Are the people like, uh, I suppose, the, the Desert Alliance, but are there other organizations or networks of people besides yourself that are pushing in this other way that are, that are whose influence may be increasing, or at least is substantial? I think you have the old standby organizations. Okay, all right. Um, and these range from Defenders of Wildlife. Uh-huh to a group like the Desert Bighorn Sheep Society whose sole purpose in life mm -hmm. is to have more sheep so they mm -hmm. can shoot more sheep. <laughs> um, you have organizations like the Yuma Valley Rod and Gun Club that okay. thinks of all that area as simply a, 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 a um, wildlife farm. Mm -hmm. And, and then you still have uh, groups like um, the Center for Biological Diversity that's, you know, pushing for um, more protection of uh, Sonoran Desert Tortoise. Uh, I, don't, I don't know where it is right now with the flat-tailed horned lizard, but they were working hard on that. Uh, the Nature Conservancy has been uh, an influence, particularly south of the border. Uh, Sierra Club is very good on specific issues. But uh, you know they're they're so they, they have to deal with all the issues in, in uh, Arizona. Part of what's happened to Sierra Club is that they've gotten away from 
just, it, it, this is how it seems to me, from just nature and in, in, environmental issues in that sense to, to everything to uh, water pollution, air pollution, um, um, economic rights for disadvantaged people, yeah. Uh, equal rights for access to uh, natural areas and stuff. Uh, you don't have a, f a very wide spectrum of interest. Right. And um, part of the part of the real problem out there, and I say this is a problem, but you know, some people say, well, it's not a problem because nobody seems to be worried about it. <laughs> um, it's it's real hard to do much unless you're allied or working with some kind of an organization that has uh, legal status, yeah. has some money, has um, a membership that can, can, mm -hmm. can write letters on demand. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's just real hard to do things just as an individual. As an individual. Yeah. All right. Well, how about individuals who work sort of network with these numbers of other organizations? Are there a lot of people? I mean, like you do, don't you? Sort of know who these people are, know who to call? I used to know better than I know now. Uh-huh. Because uh, what I've been doing the last few years is trying to channel it into to the writing. research and the writing. Right. And well, that's uh, I understand that completely. Um, and part of that is a direct result of the uh, eight years of the Bush administration. Right. Cause in essence, everything was on hold, and exactly. so a number of organizations um, had had kind of core groups working on problems. Yeah. But but if you're not seeing any progress, those people, although their heart may still be on your particular issue, whatever it is, they wander off to other things that are more active. You know, whoever's got a game going at the moment, they'll go. Okay. And and they can come back if you have something worth fighting for. All right, well then, this is a really good opportunity for me to ask this question then, because it's directly related to our sense that these um, embedded organizations like the International Desert uh, Alliance, the International Sonoran Desert Alliance, and others um, that may even have a cultural or uh, other aspects to them and mm -hmm. may be embedded in place are organizations that may tide an area over bad times like this period when everybody's just worried about the border as a security mm -hmm. issue uh, or uh, that for reason immigration eclipses everything else and may or bad times when nobody's interested in the environment which is certainly we've had some bad years mm -hmm. that these organizations at least provide a base of interested people who have some antenna out there on the land and have some sense of what's going on, even to the point of BLM not enforcing its mandate. Right. The watchdogs are, okay. are on, on duty. That's right. And so what these organizations do is they sort of serve as a, a clearinghouse of, of information, reports of damage, or, and, and sometimes it's just informal. Sometimes, for example, Jack Dikinga will be out there mm -hmm. taking pictures, and he'll call up and right. on his little cell phone and say, "Hey, Bill, did you know about this damage out there? You know, and I got pictures of it." And, yeah. and so I'll send that message on to somebody else. That, and, and so things sort of work around, and, and you actually get these fairly, fairly uh, uh, expansive emails that you know that <laughs> starts off as to one person, and pretty soon there's 25 names on it. There's no secrets. Once you send an email, you yeah. you better say what yeah. you want to say, say carefully because, because everybody's along. It's everybody's going to gonna read it. The forward button. Right, right. And uh, you know, sometimes people who you think are allies are not so much allies on that particular day or issue. Or they they sincerely think that somebody else may be interested in. in uh, right. But I I think the people that live out there are genuinely concerned about the social effects. Mm -hmm. Of having their their homeland, their territory, their recreation, uh, you know, particularly particularly members of, of the uh, native nation, mm -hmm. and um, but I, everybody sort of has their own way of, of of coping or trying to deal with things, and so what what happens is that you, some things that may seem a problem to me are not problems, problems to other to people, right? Do you think 
it becoming a problem for somebody else and this level of communication at least makes you aware I don't know I was complaining about the F whatever they are the flying over because they come right over our house and I went over to our neighbor and I said I want you to sign this petition <laughs> And she said, well, it doesn't bother me a bit, but if it bothers you, I'll sign. <laughs> it bothers other people I know, so I'm, I'll support this, she said. And I just wondered whether or not that level of communication is facilitated at all by these groups who may transcend these cultural and economic and social differences. Well, I, I mean, there's all this talk of fragmentation, and God knows... You know, I, I don't even know anybody who thinks the immigration, Arizona immigration thing is a good idea. And yet more than 50% of the people in this state think that. I've never even met one. <laughs> I either. <laughs> I think they live north of the Gila River. <laughs> um, but I think everybody acknowledges something needs to be done. You know? Right, so, right. Yeah, part of it, I think, Helen, comes down to how you how you frame the question or the okay. problem. Okay. And most of us have this sort of uneasy feeling that the things are drifting off course or mm -hmm. you know, headed into the rocks. But to, to, for a real test, you have to get you have to get a specific proposal. Okay. Or have to. It seems to me you have to frame the problem. Um, for example, when Mexico decided that on the road to Rocky Point, they were going to put in a, um, a uh, chemical dump, for lack of a better term. I can't remember what they were calling it, but they were going to have a, a um, chemical waste dump there along the highway. And there's actually a big fence and still part of a building down there. They were going to bring bring toxic chemicals and just dig a hole and put them in the desert because I thought it wouldn't affect anybody. Well, because the, and, and I think Gary was, was part of the, the, uh, the, the people that fought this, but what happens is then you have something particular that people can yeah. sign the petitions, yeah. they can write the letters, they can make the calls and, and raise that hue and cry that this isn't the place. Right, it's like the F-16, you have to have an issue. Right. Right, you have to have something very specific. And then my understanding is that once that happened, the the business people in, in Rocky Point, Puerto Penasco, mm -hmm. said, wait a minute, we can't have our guests being upset and think they're going to have to drive through this toxic dump to get here. Right. So then they make the phone calls behind the scenes, and they put the pressure on, and they they figure out some way to to derail it. And uh, that's what they did. Okay. So if you were to sort of write a bigger narrative of what's been, been going on here for a long time, would you sort of make it an episodic thing of one of these issues after another with attempts at coalitions and attempts at uh, turning back threats or, more positively, opportunities to extend wilderness or extend protections? Or, and would you see that that is just an episodic thing? Do you see it as a generally optimistic story? One of the things that David said he heard, because I had to leave early, was that you guys said there were like 45 centers related to the Sea of Cortez, and you think it's getting more attention than it ever did? Is, did he hear wrong? In any case, I was interested. I don't know. <laughs> I didn't hear that. Yeah. Um, for example, on the Sea of Cortez, uh, there's been some excellent books come out recently. Yeah. Um, Rick Bruska, for example, had one come out uh, last month, or I guess. Uh, yeah, I think month you mentioned it now. to me in one of your emails. Yeah. Um, other things are coming I out. I saw that on the, the edge thing. The book I got that and it was very helpful. Good. Thank you. you. Know, I, there, there's so many things like that happening. Um, you know, somebody else for your list would be uh, Jay Nichols and Jeff Seminar, if they aren't already. No. And be because they've been working on turtle research in the Gulf, and turtle research being sea turtle research mm -hmm. being kind of the microcosm yeah. for the rest of the problems. And by by framing it in terms of sea turtles, they've been able to, to convince the the native fishermen cooperatives. Okay to revise their catch methods, revise their traps and put 
turtle excluders and all kinds of stuff. And, and so that once, once people can visualize um, that there's a problem for something we love, then, then they can sort of wrap their mind around it. But to just say, you know, there's global warming, it, it doesn't quite do it. It doesn't do it at all. And, and it, it's, um, you know, I remember the days, for example, back in the uh, late 60s, very early 70s, when when air pollution was Los Angeles Basin, and it was in Arizona, it was the copper smelters. Right. And all those big smokestacks have only been torn down. I know. Things have changed. It's so much better. You don't have that San Manuel plume coming it. through Reddington Pass. I remember it. And uh, you know, people in Ajo lived through all that too, where the, you'd get certain atmospheric conditions and it would actually press that, that toxic cloud of you know, sulfur dioxide and all kinds of other crummy stuff right down on the ground and right through your front door. Right. And uh, it, was, it was income, so people lived with it. Right. But, you know, that's change, and that's, that's change for the better. And I really think that even though, even though politicians have to do the, the actual uh, enactment, but I, I do think that there are a number of positive things that are happening. And, okay. and you know, the, the, the fact that back in, in, in 35 and 37, we got organ pipe and we got Cabeza Prieta. And then in 40 or 41, we got the Goldwater Range. And then in uh, 2000, we got Sonoran Desert National Monument. These are all positive steps. Right. And it ratchets it up for more protection. But along with protection, it's, it's kind of like uh, this Western National Parks Association group that, that David's such a strong part of. There, there has to be education. Right. And there has to be understanding. There has to be... Uh, uh, for the research, there has to be, um, you know, we have to figure out and, and share these mysteries of, of what's there and what we're interested in and uh, why it's, why it should be protected. Because, you, you know, you take somebody out there in the middle of June and then it's not quite obvious. Well, you, it is. Why do you want to protect this? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and yet, uh, we had a lovely trip um, a year and a half ago with uh, one lady from Oslo and a lady from New York. And uh, elderly ladies. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, it's um, uh, the ladies, ladies of a certain uh, re age. retirement age. Right. And uh, and they had never camped in the desert before. And so Joe Wilder and a couple other friends and I took them out there. They just had a marvelous time in this place, taking pictures and looking. And they had read some about it beforehand. Right. But they had never been there to see it on the ground. It was just, yeah. it was just that. That recognition of here's a place right. I, I can love, right? Which is sort of is a, is a question that I've had about about the center. You know, it seems to be a kind of watering hole for a lot of uh, desert rats. Uh, Joe seems to provide a place for a lot of people yeah. who've got. <laughs> He's amazing. Yeah, isn't he? <laughs> isn't he? He's amazing. Yeah, and he provides a sticking point at a, in a university where there are just not that many pe places to mm -hmm. latch onto it if yeah. you're not an academic. Yeah. And, uh, and yet he does that, and he connects yeah. with yeah. the I think more so than most of the departments down there, he makes this bridge between the larger community mm -hmm. and the university community. Mm -hmm. You know, the university community is a pretty, pretty insulated, pretty isolated group yes. in general. And... Um, I'm not, I don't think that's a compliment. No, it isn't. I don't want to get too far away from this narrative about positive things. Well, let's go back to, okay, let's go, go back to positive because okay. what, what I think, what I think maybe you're, you're getting at is that there are still some very positive things that can be done. Right. Um, to upgrade. To my mind, the biggest upgrade will be when they do two things. And actually, at this last AHO meeting, they, they talked again about this. So it's, it's not a dead thing. But one is to formalize the, the sister parks concept mm -hmm. and even call it a sister park or, or a peace park, a binational, international, whatever terms they use. More than it currently is. More than it currently is. Uh, it's on paper, and, and uh, the Penicotti and, and um, 
organ pipe for biosphere reserves. And there's, there's kind of a very low-key cooperation between the two, but it's not, it's not officially mandated or sanctioned or funded by law of Congress. Uh, you know, since 1932, we've had the Waterton Glacier International Peace right. Park with Canada, right. and it seems to be working quite well. Yes, it does. But this is part of the larger um, problem that we simply ignore neighbor to the south. Um, and, and to me, once we get this immigration thing turned out, figured out, it has to get figured out, it can't go the way it is, um, designating Oregon Pipe, Cabeza Prieta, the Pinacati as as uh, a, um, a borderland international peace park, whatever you want to call it, is, is going to be something to remind us that these are our neighbors. I wonder about the Biosphere Reserve. Could you talk a little bit about the things that have happened since that designation and why a further designation would hold even greater hope than what we've done? Well, Biosphere Reserve is is kind of an amorphous thing yeah, it doesn't it it doesn't bring any money and uh, to make things happen you have to have money okay and biosphere reserve is kind of a feel good designation and mm -hmm. it allows you to manage certain things in certain ways and it one thing that biosphere does do Helen is it allows you to uh, enter into cooperative agreements with neighboring agencies mm -hmm. and uh, and even private landowners uh, one thing that Gary worked on along with the rest of us was trying to get parts or, or all of the Cabeza Prieta designated the Biosphere Reserve and it never got signed. And also parts of the uh, Goldwater Range also designated something special because it's a very special place and the military is the biggest player out there right now um, in, in terms of being an actual landowner. And, and part of what we were trying to do with um, suggesting that whole thing be created as a um, binational park right. back in uh, 98 right. was to have Park Service have a much larger role in management because Park Service deals with the complete package of everything from wildlife to endangered species to scenery to tourists to education <coughs> and uh, for as something like uh, Fish and Wildlife Service, they don't do cultural resources, and they yeah. don't do much education. No, they don't. But, but even if you could do do something larger, where Fish and Wildlife Service and the, the Defense Department were involved in in a larger biosphere reserve, or into a larger um, sister parks thing mm -hmm. you know retain its own identity and still be a sister park you, you you could manage it that way part of what what these agencies have found out the people were trying to tell them long before they listened was that your problems don't stop at your boundary right and whether it's groundwater withdrawal or it's pesticide drift or it's illegal immigrants or it's uh, trespassers or, or whatever it is You've got to cooperate with your neighbors because this is an eco region, right? And you have to see it that way. The, and to my mind, the biggest thing that could be done out there for that ground at the moment, um, and it, it it'll come up again in five or six years, is the opportunity to do a world heritage okay uh, site out there, and that too would bring uh, certain levels of uh, uh, interest and funding and uh, research and and. Uh, you know, part of it, Helen, goes back to when you call a place something special. Right. People okay, that's treat a very it, good point. People treat it specially. And we, we, for years we saw this difference in how the um, administrative signs in the Goldwater mm -hmm. Range, the Cabeza Prieta, and in Oregon Pipe National Monument were. The ones in the Goldwater Range, which were just BLM land, right. were just shot to hell. Uh -huh. And the ones in the Cabeza Prieta might have a few bullet holes, and then the ones over there in the National Park land didn't have any bullet holes. And it was the same people in general yeah. going through. 
but it, if you if you call something by a special designation, most people will treat it in some kind of a special way. They mm -hmm. understand this is a national park, okay, and, or this is a wildlife refuge, or this is a wilderness. Okay, so there's resources and there's sort of visibility that come right. along with these right. things, and the past successes of the designation of these parks and, and set-asides mm -hmm. have had beneficial effects and you think Very that beneficial. moving right. it in this direction right. continues to be the right way to go. Right. Despite the concerns on the part of some local people that this tells them what to do. They're going to be told what to do anyway. Yeah, they are. They and, really uh, are. What, what they need to do is to be, become part of the process. That, okay. That, because all these things are done in public meetings and they're done with uh, NEPA um, and you know, people have concerns of what they want to do. And frequently when you pin them down, they don't actually want to do it, but they just want to be able to if they wanted to. Yeah. You know, they're not going to go out and build a campfire next week, but if they wanted to, they'd be able to. Right. They don't want you telling you you can't chop down a native tree and, and build a campfire. Although they they don't want to do that, right? You know, it, it's 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 a very basic psychology, I think. Right. And uh, it's kind of a Western cowboy thing, isn't yeah. it? It's, yeah. Uh, that everything is allowed except you just wouldn't do it. Yeah. 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 Um, on this uh, business of of a narrative, uh, in your view, were there times of particular opportunity where things took a clear turn for the better, like there's a disjunction and things got way better, and do you see that time in 93 as being that? Or are there other times where there was another disjunction and things got way worse? We talked a few minutes ago about the Bush legacy in those eight years where clearly nothing much happened. Um, I think the part of the Bush legacy we've inherited today in this immigration problem. Yes. Because that's a very good point. Simply by inattention, yeah. immigration law was not enforced yeah. in, in various ways. And it's not Border Patrol's fault, they just didn't get the support. And uh, of course this, this also extends back probably into the Clinton administration. But um, the Border Patrol guys um, there's a very interesting piece, and it's probably still on the website, um, an organization called um, Retired Border Patrol Officers. It's for BPO or something like that. And, and what they did is they made a position statement. They said to control the border, we don't need new laws, we just need to enforce the ones we have. And they point out that what what happened was after the Immigration Reform um, Control Act, the IRCA of 1986, the, right. uh, the uh, Simpson-Mazzoli Act, right. that it was a pretty good act, but it was it was implemented at differential times, and parts of it were unfunded, right. like a, a system for uh, employers to identify workers and so that didn't get done and then there was a big push to uh, legalize all those that were here and uh, fraud was rampant everybody had papers that showed they'd lived here forever and right. you know, they just came last week and so it, it got to be a real mess in that respect but those kinds of problems as well as economic problems, you talk about NAFTA, and this is Chuck Bowden's point, is that NAFTA basically uh, did away with with Mexico's economy and tried to shift it to to uh, something else, and then China jumped in and they stole all the Maquiladora jobs, uh, you know, paying yeah. paying less wages. So. Uh, that promise left, but at the same time... So you, you think in some ways NAFTA was a turning point economically for northern Mexico in a negative way? Very negative way, and, and the one you should talk to about that would be Ezekiel Escura. Yeah, I will. Uh, because what he talked about was, was what NAFTA did to the price of flour and, and corn and tortillas. Uh -huh. 
And so that people in, in Chiapas or, you know, the southern states, they, they saw their entire way of life change mm -hmm. for things that they didn't even understand and certainly had no control or say in. And um, it, it really revolutionized the Mexican economy and in, in many ways opened the door. And this is partly Chuck's point, you know, you read War as Laboratory of Our Future that this, this opened the door for this narco economy. Yeah. And, um, of course, they, they moved right in. <laughs> okay, so you connect the narco economy a bit with NAFTA. Yes, yes. Okay. And, um, you know, I, this, is, this is one of the toughest things, I think, for environmental people who understand about, you know, this tree over here and this cactus over there is how these larger sweeps of things yes. tie into local problems. Yes. And um, it, that, that's, you, you talk about the opportunities. The Arizona Wilderness Act was a big opportunity and that was taken. In 1993, um, the, the, um, the founding of ISDA, mm -hmm. and at that same meeting, Ezekiel Escura, as Charles Chester put in his book, and, and Wendy knows even more of this story, um, decided, you know, we've had these sort of designations and ideas for the Penacati in the Upper Gulf, and I'm in a position to do them, let's just do them. Yeah. And it happened. Yes. And it happened within an amazingly short period of time. But that had to do with the right person being there at the right time with the authority to do it. Right. But that, that person, once again, because of his own research and his own conservation work, was plugged in yes. to the right people in, in the region, on the, on the ground. Um, and, and uh, you know, he's certainly the, he, Ezekiel is the hero in that story, but he'll be the first to tell you that, that he didn't do it by himself. Uh, people like Alberto Burquez, who we have yeah, on your right, list. Right. You know, it, it's the kind of thing, and we almost got something done in 98 and 99. Okay. And that, that's, to my mind, the big opportunity missed, and that's probably my fault because I'm not an organizer. But we had an opportunity to organize Goldwater, Cabeza Prieta, Sonoran Desert National Monument, and Organ Pipe and make the largest national park and preserve in the southern 48 states. How did that come about, the well, opportunity? It, the opportunity came about because the military had to re, um, had to get Congress to do a new withdrawal for the Goldwater Range. Oh, I see. And so there was going to be this big public process, big public uh, set of hearings, and um, that the Goldwater Range would then be turned over to the military. It, the, the, the Goldwater Range is not a reservation. It's public land that's been withdrawn for military purposes. And so what happens is that there was a chance the military... So it really is BLM land withdrawn BL by... Yeah. BLM okay. land. And in 1986, the, um, the Congress had assigned management of that land to BLM as an unfunded mandate. And, of course, BLM spread very thin to begin with. Right. There was nothing they could do for the military. Right. So the military had a, a number of problems caused by the inattention and inability of uh, BLM to to help them manage the natural resources yeah. and cultural resources. And um, so the military was looking for somebody else to be the manager of the ground mm -hmm. and, and assume that cost and responsibility. And a number of us, well, some of us anyway, were talking to the military about that as far as, well, you've got Fish and Wildlife Service next door. Right, right. But Fish and Wildlife Service doesn't doesn't have much more money than BLM does, right. and they don't do cultural resources. And that was one of the big sticking points with the military is that right. you know, they're responsible, uh, Sykes Act and so on, for a big chunk of ground. Yes, they are. And if if 
if they don't manage that land correctly, Congress may someday take it away from them. And that's a big threat because the Goldwater is a major training range. Right, right. And um, so the agency that, that looked viable was the U.S. Park Service. And because they do cultural resources, they do endangered species, they do all these other things. And so we talked about trying to combine management to have the Park Service be the ones that handle the public visitors and the animals. Right. And the, as far as we were concerned, the, you know, the military could do whatever it needed to do because Park Service has a designation called National Preserve. Okay. That's like a national park, yeah. but a couple of exceptions. Like Big Thicket has uh, uh, oil drilling in it and has ATVs. Mm -hmm. um, the the big national preserves in Alaska they have uh, hunting. Yeah. Big game hunting. You know we're not against some of those things. Right. Um, but if you want to protect the overall picture and have a grip on those, then you you need to have a strong manager. And Park Service, of course, has has, has more money and more clout with Congress. Right. And um, we almost got it done, and, and we didn't get it done. Um, one of the people in McCain's office, um, who, who was running his uh, legislation at that time, he actually introduced a, uh, a study bill for us. And um, But she said, you know, if you would have started this a year earlier, yeah. we could have got this done. But they're just... What ran out of time was that the delegation, Kyle and, and, and McCain in particular, and, and Bob Stump was still there at that time, they wanted that range renewed now. They didn't want to fiddle around with more studies and what might work and so on. And, and so that um, opportunity just we lost that opportunity. Right. But that opportunity could come again yes, or it could, right. you know, change or see something better. So what they rely on now is this, this Goldwater Partners meeting, yes. which is called the Barium Goldwater Executive Council or something like that. I never can remember the exact name. And it, it's basically a partners. The partners don't have any, any real vote. The military is the one that makes the final decisions on the range. Uh -huh. But it listens very carefully to the partners. Right. And partners have, you know, BLM, Arizona, the Game and Fish Department, the, uh, the State Historic Preservation Officer, the SHPO. Um, because, once again, it goes back to what, what uh, Wendy was trying to do out there getting these people to talk to each other and try to cooperate. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it, one reason I don't even like the word collaboration is because if you're going to collaborate, you have to have, at least have some, some flour and eggs and milk to yeah. make something. Yeah. You, know, you, have, you have to have a recipe. And um, it, I think so much of it has to go back a couple of steps before that to to simple communication and cooperation and goodwill and right. and uh, studying the same problems and you know right. what are you saying and, and uh, then if we're going to collaborate and do something then we've got the foundation right that's exactly what I'm yeah I hope that picked it up um, let's see I got so interested in what you're saying I forgot my next question which <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry Ellen. that's all right um, uh, I guess I want to ask you before I go too far here about um, we've talked about turning points and events and things. Are there particular key non-human species or insults to particular places? We talked a little bit about this uh, uh, toxic dump along the road, but and we talked a little bit about the pronghorn and the tortoise. Are there other looking things? looking for poster children. Yes, exactly. Um, Soren Pronghorn is probably one of the poster children. Um, you've got bats, lesser long nosed bats. Oh, that's bats. right. Um, the lowly desert tortoise, I think, is one of them. I do too. But, you know, of all the species, I think it comes back down to humans. Yeah. I think we've done drastic things to, to to people and their relationship with a with a wonderful ground mm -hmm. i think we've done 
some devastating things to native peoples who are accustomed to going back and forth across the border mm -hmm. and, to, and, and who see this this land according to Wendy's map. You know, when, when you think of if, if you're a, uh, a Piman speaking person right, right. and you go from Ajo and down to Caborca and you speak Papago and then you go up to um, Pila Bend and you still speak Papago and then you go over toward Yuma and there used to be a little Yachidodam community over there and then you go up to uh, almost to Phoenix and Chandler and you know you're still speaking Papago, Pima right, up there. Right. So it's, this is kind of the western Papagoria and uh, there was that wonderful book that Jeff Altschul and uh, Adrian Rankin did um, called Fragile Patterns, Archaeology of the Western Papagoria. Yeah. And it, it fits that area. And it's just a nice way to look at this ground, mm -hmm. both prehistorically and historically, as well as ecologically. Yeah. And uh, the ecological understanding and, and care and concern, Helen, to my mind, has to encompass this whole area. Because you, you can't just manage a Cabeza Prieta refuge anymore. Right. You've got to manage what's in Mexico, and you've got to see what your partners do, whether it's the, you know, my pronghorn crosses the border and goes down to your biosphere reserve, or people jump off the bus and, and uh, try to hike up to Phoenix through my refuge, or, you know, what's happening out here. But, but you have to have these, these other connections. connections right. And eventually, sometime, we have to talk about, you know, to give you an analogy, it, it's like capital punishment. You know, I think the world can do without some of these characters. I just assume seeing them, you know, see them drop down an endless chute and never heard of again. You expunge their names and stuff. But, but although that might feel good, what does that do to me? And you know, can I can I can, I can I can I treat people that way? Even right. even those kind of people. Right. And and I, I I worry about what we do to our our ground when we when we think that we can you know dig a mining pit down here in the Santa Ritas and have no effect. Right. You know maybe we desperately need that mineral, but what does it do to us? What does it do to our social fabric and our yeah. culture? And, and I don't think we look hard enough at those things. For for years we've. Uh, particularly during the Bush years, everything's had a dollar sign. On it. Right. And and and. Um, well, I think you're making a pretty work. pretty compelling argument to think about people and nature together. Uh, that the social and ecological kind of belong together, mm -hmm. and you can't sort of separate yeah. them. Yeah. Separate them out. Ecological justice, or some kind of phrase. And yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure somebody said that. But um, it, um, while I'm looking to see if I've picked up all my questions, I've got one thing that I was going to ask you about. I have been trying to um, look at, talk to Peggy Boyer, Peggy and Rick Boyer. Oh, a couple and, of my other heroes. Yes, yes. exactly. <laughs> and she tells me that there was a, what did she say? Hold on, I think I've even got the notes of what she says. She said there was she wrote something that was in something that you edited? Yeah, Dry Borders. Yeah, Dry Borders. Mm -hmm. Is that where it is? Mm -hmm. And that's where I'll find it? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's what I'm going to do. It's about the good, Dry it's, Borders. It's about the fa founding of Sado. That's what I need. And, and what that's they were Dry doing. Borders. Okay. It even has a, a wedding picture of them in there. Okay, great. <laughs> that's exactly what I need. She did a wonderful job on it. And uh, because what we were trying to do with that, Helen, is and there's a couple other conservation style chapters in there, but but you have kind of this upstart organization, Sado. Yeah. And how does it get started? What's the model? And, and uh, you know, what are they trying to do? What's been their influence? And it, there, there, of course, were days that that Peggy and Rick were were threatened with all kinds of stuff. Oh yeah. You know, threatened to you know lynch them or shoot them or run them out of town or burn their house down or yeah any number of things, and yet they hung tough down there. Yeah. 
Well, when she was talking about it, I've been to a couple of these celebration meetings just to sort of immerse mm -hmm. myself in this stuff. And as she talks about it, it's just one crisis after another. Mm -hmm. You know, when you think the thing would fold and then they sort of reinvent themselves in a new way. And then they found out that somebody owned the ground next door and they had to do this fundraising thing so they, so yeah. they didn't get their right. road cut off and stuff. I right. mean, very inventive, very tough people. And, and uh, But yet right. what, what they have come to rely on is being very open in their community, right. very transparent, and always thinking about the greater good. All right, so if we're trying to take, think, think about networkers like these people, inventive, open, transparent, resilient, yep. maybe? Yep. Anything else? Um, open means they're willing to take on board different ideas. I was sort of surprised they had their meeting with this uh, developer of one of those amazingly ugly high towers there <laughs> on the beach. <laughs> that Well, they're, they are certainly inclusive. They gotta be. So they maybe inclusive. Be. Well, the other thing is they have to have a long-term vision. Okay. And, and as I, I, they have to, they have to be working not for themselves, but for the greater good of the community. And, and people sense that, you know, if you're, you're, you're trying to do it just so that you have a job yeah, or so that you actually do something positive for our children and grandchildren. And I, I'm increasingly amazed, uh, Helen, by the number of, of people who, who do things because it may affect their children and grandchildren. Yeah, well, as a grandmother, I'm not amazed. I understand. <laughs> well, I, <yeah. laughs> You were, you were probably pretty altruistic right, anyway. Right, so. right. Well, one would like to think so, wouldn't yeah, one? Yeah, yeah. But it, it, it becomes, um, you know, especially, once again, we go back to, uh, to the Bush years, there's a whole lot of cynicism Yeah. that, that I found very erosive or corrosive or what are you going to call it. That, that um, Maybe optimism is another, or... Maybe not cynicism, but uh, there is a characteristic of people who believe things, good things can happen. Good things can happen if we make them happen. Yeah. Because that kind of cynicism is certainly... Yeah. And it sort of sounds as if that's the sort of cynicism that may taint the relationship of people to government agencies, that they can't do mm -hmm. anything right. Well, and... and uh you know, some of the environmental groups are, are not quite willing to compromise, and I, yeah. I understand why, because, you know, once you, once you tame a wilderness, it can never be wilderness again. But at some point, you may have to cut some deals and may have to compromise and may have to well, you know, I always figure wonder different ways to do stuff. So. If they're not the people who live there and can hold out forever for agreements, uh, and are anxious for big wins, maybe they're not the right representatives of, you know, may, because it seems to me that sometimes environmental groups hang too tough. Mm. They would rather lose and be right than... Yeah, yeah. yeah. But it, there's, there's another side of that too, is that, you know, as, as an American, I think of national forests as being mine as much as somebody that lives next door to it. Right. You know, to me, it's public land, and, yeah, that's true. and I should have a say in it. And that's what what bedevils me about some of the grazing and logging decisions right. that are made or mining decisions. Right. And they're national, and they've got a national focus. Right. Yeah. And, and the other thing I think that's happening too is that um, people have been a little creative and thinking about how you can do conservation areas in different area, different uh, locales with uh, private private property, for mm -hmm. example. And so, how can you, how can you retain some of these functions and values for scenery or for wildlife? Um, you know, for example, one thing that that needs to be done. I'm not the one who's going to get it done. Is that Highway 8 between Stanfield and Gila Bend needs to be made a scenic highway yeah. in State 8 because it's. It, it's got one 
cell phone tower, but otherwise it's unblemished. There's no billboards, there's not many signs, it's, it's, it's the only stretch of interstate I know of, Helen, that goes through uh, Sonoran Desert that's, that's pristine, that's um, you know, still beautiful. It doesn't have all the little truck stops and things in it. Yeah. And uh, you know, even if you take Highway uh, 10 from Tonopah to uh, Quartzsite, um, most of that's you know, it's got little uh, raggedy trailer parks and stuff off to the side, or where somebody, you know, has their little desert uh, escape house out there, an abandoned trailer or something, and. and uh, you know, so we need to be thinking about some of these larger picture opportunities. The opportunities are there if we could just, you know, part of what part of what's needed in the state of Arizona. And and at one time, John McCain claimed this role, but he hasn't uh, done it for a while. Uh, is some kind of white hat in the Senate? Yeah. That's willing to do some stuff. Yeah. And uh, yeah, don't get me started on on that, but. Well, but uh, maybe the Congress isn't a place to look for leadership these days. Well, unfortunately, Congress is the one that has to enact things. I know that's one of the great and, problems. Uh, you know, it's, it's like uh, the House has, I don't know, 100, 150 bills in the Senate right now that <laughs> that the Senate refuses to even consider. I know. And, uh, Which then goes back to one of these questions I do need to ask, and that is, we've talked about it a little bit, because we've talked about these designations of the biosphere reserve, mm -hmm. the sister parks, other kinds of things as being important. Are there um, policies and laws that have, have also hindered things? I guess we've talked about the NAFTA. Clearly that created a lot of consequences, economic consequences, mm -hmm. that have been bad for the board. Mostly unintended. Yeah, okay. So you think a lot of the institutional stuff are unintended consequences. I guess that the, we talked about the um, uh, border, the Immigration Reform Act and its failure to be implemented with some unintended consequences. What, what, what long-time Border Patrolmen tell me is that if it had been fully implemented, and seriously done, it, it we would. wouldn't have the problem we have today. Yeah. yeah. But it was incompletely funded, and uh, then they also found, you know, Senator so and so would call and say, "Well, uh, I don't want you guys doing this in uh, Southern California." Yeah. Or you know, some special interest group tries to to um, get something changed or put on hold or get an injunction or you know. Everybody wants it exactly how they want it, and uh, unfortunately, a lot of people have died because of that. They sure have. We've got one of those no more deaths things in our yard in Bisbee. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we had a little trouble maintaining it here in Tucson. People kept <laughs> taking it down. These are powerful issues for people. Yeah, they really but, are. Uh, you know, it's... Um, uh, something else that we didn't touch on here, but uh, I'll go ahead and mention is that the part of the reason that these designations help, mm -hmm. whether it's wilderness, national monument, national park, national preserve, um, biosphere reserve mm -hmm. in Mexico, is that you then have a defined destination for tourists. Yeah. Because somewhere along the line, you, you need some economic base. Uh, you can't just just um, have a town like Ajo that's based on retirees and uh, uh, border patrol yeah. paychecks. You, you have to get that tourism in there, and I, th I think that's one thing that uh, um, ISD has been been pretty good about doing is is uh, sponsoring that Sonoran and Shindig, yeah, which right. gives uh, people something to come down and, and have fun with. There's the fiddlers contest. There's a lot more social stuff in Ajo now for um, the uh, part-time resident and also for the tourist. Right. Because you have to have something to bring money in. You know, the bottom line is if, if people live there, they have to have an income. Right. And something else that, that I think is limited Ajo is that it, it doesn't have like a junior college or something there. It, it's lacking that advanced education component 
there, you know, there may be people that come down from NAU or I don't know where they're going to get it to, now. Yeah. Do you? It's but um, to, to do special classes, but I, yeah. you know, the way the universities are having to cut back now, I don't that's right. That's right. I don't. Not right away. It won't. Yeah. There's a little. Well, they did things for uh, Sierra Vista. I mean, they, they are capable of well, doing, yeah. But, you know, whether they can afford to continue I that, I don't that. know either. I doubt I, I, I have and, my doubts. Uh, yeah, so that's a pretty nice building they have over there, Sierra Vista. Uh, there's a little college on the reservation, but it, uh, yeah, I can't, I can't even think college. of the name of it, a little community college of I some kind. Yeah. But, uh, you know, that brings in another part of the mix of um, instructors and, and uh uh, educated people have right. a little bit broader horizon, right. but also it allows you a, a, a point of focus or a destination for, yeah. for students in school. And they can take advanced placement classes there and they can do this and it gives them a, a way to go to college for e you know even a couple of years. Before they can transfer before they, to you. Before they transfer that they, they can stay home, save some money and, right. and do that kind of stuff. Part of the problem with Ajo is there's not much in the way of employment for for teenagers. No. You know, you need almost a, a CCC program or, or something over there that, that can get them involved. The, uh, you know, ISDA's had some things for youth, and uh, the Boy Scouts have been pretty active over there. I know a um, wildlife refuge uh, person and also a border patrolman that got involved with their careers because they were Boy Scouts in all. Right, right. So there, there's there's that interesting component. But uh, I've always believed in that uh, sort of community service in exchange for help for education. I've always thought that was really a good idea. I wish they'd do something like that for doctors too. I do too. Mm -hmm. I, in fact, I'm very much in favor of that kind of connection of education to service. Yeah. And Clinton was very big on it. And Obama said some things, but it's not been a... I haven't seen it yet. No, it hasn't been a centerpiece of recovery, and it could have been. Uh, yeah, I thought the stimulus package would include a bunch of that. Yeah, I did too, but it didn't It didn't happen. Well, instead we Maybe it's going to take uh, this oil spill. Maybe that'll be the tiny <laughs> sliver of silver out of the oil spill. We'll get a... Well, I people. think there's a still another $700 billion or something of stimulus that they can spend. So well, we may need every we penny. We may need every penny of it. So, I thought it was interesting that BP was trying to hire some of the shrimpers down there to go out and clean up oil and stuff. Co-optation, the big one. Yeah, 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 you work for us now. Yeah. Right, he was passing around 5,000 bucks like it was going out of style. Hoping yeah, to sign this Turn enemies into friends. Well, thank you very much.